If you're a regular visitor to the FX Medicine website, you would have seen many of our great infographics. These are all now available for use in your clinic. You can download them for free. And the high resolution versions are available for purchase as A3 or A2 posters or as a digital file. Simply click on the button beneath your favourite infographics at fxmedicine.com.au. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us in the studio again today is Dr. Mark Donahue, who earned his medical degree from Sydney Uni in 1980. Mark worked around the central coast of New South Wales honing his medical skills, and this is where his interest in integrative medicine sparked. Because patients just weren't fitting into the boxes of diagnoses and treatments which were drummed into him in medical school. Mark is considered one of the fathers of integrative medicine in Australia, and he's been a vanguard for patient health throughout his whole career. Welcome back, Mark. How are you? Well, 1980 doesn't sound that long ago to <laughs> no, me, so I guess I'm guess i doing okay. Yeah, it was Thank better you. music. You can rest assured of that. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we're going to be discussing certain facets, there are so many, of pain mm. and how it affects our patients. We've got to start off, though. What is pain? Anything from Lawrence of Arabia? Yes, to yes. There, there is the famous line, the trick, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts. And it's one of those great lines from the movies. Pain is extraordinarily difficult, even after 35 years, oh, or much less than that, obviously, <laughs> but even after 35 years in practice, the concept of pain, the subjective nature of pain, what is pain is one of the hardest questions to answer, I yeah. think, after all that time. We know it's not and, and, a sense. Now, generally you ask people, is a sense of pain? But the senses, the five senses do not include pain and that's not an accident. The five senses do not include pain and that's not an accident because going right back to Aristotle and before, the concept of pain is that it's an emotion. It is a sense, a feeling. It is an experience of the body. And so I think the general agreement now is that pain is the experience of something as a threat to the body, a threat of either injury or th a threat of damage. But it's the experience of it. It's not the literal thing. And we separate it from nociception. We have this idea that there are receptors around looking all the time for broken bones, for threats, to bites from big cats, you know, all these kind of evolutionary things that we understand. Pain serves a very, very good purpose in that if you've got receptors, just simple little unmyelinated nerve endings hanging all around the body, when things go wrong, when inflammation uh, occurs, when trauma occurs in an area, there's a non-specific response where the brain does understand that damage is occurring or the threat of damage is occurring and the pain motivates the release of chemicals, which we call endorphins, but something which moderates that, which allows the animal, if they're being chased or bitten or whatever, to escape from injury, to get away. So, I think that the idea that pain is an emotion probably goes a bit far because that allows us, us humans to say, well, animals can't experience emotions, therefore they can't have pain, therefore we can ah, experiment but they can on them. can experience emotions. Well, I know. I've got Digby. <laughs> and, and my, the famous dog. Uh, yeah, my famous Mr. Digby. And Digby definitely does experience pain and Absolutely. definitely does display the same kind of emotional responses as I would in the same circumstances. However, Digby is different than patients. I learned this just in these last few weeks. He traumatized himself, got an ear infection, managed to tread on an oyster, sliced open his foot. The difference is dogs don't bring emotional baggage to pain. Ah. They don't bring a sense of their past, their fears mm. of future pain. They have not the same sense of the future. And the experience of pain is often described as Yes, it hurts, but if my life is going on like this in the future, I can't stand it. And so the concept of, you know, the, the Dharma life is suffering and that we have a future that we are going to have to work through, there's something about each individual and their response to this stimulus, this agnostic stimulus of threat, of injury, of damage, of harm. There's something about what baggage we bring from our past. 
my patients who have uh, severe emotional trauma in their past experience pain at a much higher level mm. 30, 40, 50 years later. Mm. The baggage of that kind of post-traumatic experience escalates pain. And something that I found that I th found really useful is what do the senses do? The senses experience the outside world, but we attenuate it. What does that mean? If the washing machine's going the whole time, the auditory sense dampens it down over time, so it becomes part of the background. So our five senses work in a way that says, yes, the world's out there, but the things that we expect, the normal things going on in life, they dampen down, they yeah. attenuate, and they reduce. Pain has the opposite response. Pain tends to escalate and it, the experience of it grows Amplifies, and becomes yeah. higher. So I have many people with sensory hypersensitivity, with what we now call central, sensi central sensitivities. And that central sensitivity is one said the experience of sound does not attenuate. It becomes more and more prominent in the person's consciousness until they describe it as pain. Mm. Touch, light touch on the surface of the skin, generally thought of as quite soothing, a good contact for people with that sensory sensitivity, the lightest touch can be experienced as pain. Is this akin or equivalent or have some equivalence to what's happening in um, chronic re um, complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS? Yes, I think it does. I think it does. And I, I, I think that the, the pain research area, it's unethical to do yeah. experiments yeah, on humans. Thing, yeah. And so that's one of our problems is you can do all kinds of experiments. We do do ones with photophobia. You know, so generally people attenuate to light. If you go out into bright sunlight, the pupils constrict, the whole body dampens down, the perception of light is not overwhelming. But for a lot of my patients and a lot of people who have these chronic pains and regional pains, that's not the case. The simplest stimulus is enough to escalate and escalate. And so that getting out of control, there are some mechanisms in the body that we have to control that sensory escalation, and there are some that promote it. And I think that what's happening a lot with the patients that we see with chronic pain these days is that it's not simply that there's threat to injury or that there is damage or that there is a knee that's showing osteoarthritis. It's that we bring with it expectations mm. and we bring with it a whole extra layer, which provides fabulous opportunities for intervention. So when I was in medical school, pain was all about analgesia. Uh, what can you do to stop it? Local anesthesia, general anesthesia, what can you do about pain? We had this anomaly that when people were under general anesthetic, they could experience no pain because there's no experience. You've just knocked out experience by taking out higher level functions, but the body reacted exactly the same way as it would in pain. And those people where the heart rate escalates, where the, where the trauma responses, adrenaline is released from the body, there are many of those people that wake up in an extraordinary pain while others wake up in no pain at all. So it's got, it's become much more complicated. I think it's got also complicated by, you know, these illnesses like fibromyalgia, where the problem is we cannot see why the pain arises. We call it functional pain. It's real experience because the only way that we have of measuring pain is what does a person tell us about their pain? There is no other measure. There's no objective measure whatsoever for pain. And so we can only take what the person tells us is their experience and believe it to be true. But they don't. Yes, I know. And the problem with us as doctors is we're very literal people. We like to know that there's a reason for the trauma. Why do we do so many MRIs of the back? You know, a person with low back pain, we keep on doing MRIs, CAT scans, we keep on scanning people, believing one day that we'll see the origin of the pain. Whereas the pain is a much more nebulous thing. It's not found on the MRIs and the CAT scans. And we know that now. That we've got really good studies to show that pain is an experience of around about 10% of the population at any given time, but that for 8%, we cannot determine the cause. So the majority of pain we see as practitioners, the majority of what patients tell us, I am in pain, I'm in agony, I have sore back, I have headaches, I have all of these things, the majority of times we are not going to find a cause in the very literal sense, so we need to go back into what is your experience of pain, and rather than doling out drugs, and the typical ones, the oxycodone and the opioids, rather than doling out drugs at the first opportunity, go back into the harder question, the thing that takes a bit of time in a, in a um, consultation, and that is, what is the experience? Why is the pain rather than what is the pain? A few things you said earlier on. One of the things about uh, the problematic issues that you have uh, facing 
creating pain in a patient. So it's sort of unethical to cause pain. I remember a very old study, I think it was 1966, where they studied uh, the effect of bromelain on periorbital bruising in boxes. Um, having an effect. Wow. Yeah. What a study. And I thought, can I please go into the placebo arm? <laughs> <That one. laughs> um, the other one, you're talking about massage and things like uh, touch. that. Touch. Very interesting research at the Alfred Hospital. And people can, uh, our listeners can look this up in the Integrative Cardiac Wellness Program. And what they found, and this was research um, led by Frank Rosenfeld, also Leslie Braun. There was Lisa Stangertz, Ondine Spitzer and others. But um, very important, very good researchers. And what they found was that just... Now, they couldn't do body massage, cultural reasons, personal reasons, um, but also because of drips, drains and cracked chests. So this was in the, in the heart surgery ward. And um, so what they decided on was merely a foot massage. And what they found was decreases in post-op pain medications by up to 50%. We had that experience in a hospital in the 90s when we had chemically sensitive and chronic fatigue syndrome people in hospital. Pain was one of their commonest problems. We put all of our resources, massive brains into detox, what do you do with sauna, what do we do with psychologists, what do we do with everything. At the end of it, we went back and reviewed, we put the survey out to the people who had been through the hospital the thing that worked best for managing the symptoms and the sensation of pain and distress, reflexology, foot massage, being done by my wife at the time yeah. as a kind of additional thing. But it was never just foot massage. There was also the conversation while you are touching the foot, yep. while you are massaging, there's an opportunity for interaction, for unloading. It was fascinating to me that we put up things that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars in infrastructure and costs. And at its simplest level, what did people value most? The touch and the talk had a bigger impact on pain and suffering than all of the technologies that we managed to assemble. Compared to, say, the 1960s, 70s, when you had more time per patient, do you think that part of this issue of pain, of myriad of issues with the doctor-patient relationship, less therapeutic response, shall I say, is because doctors are now restricted by time. So therefore, they just don't have that therapeutic conversation. Uh, look, I may be a grandfather of integrated medicine, but I'm not a great grandfather of integrated medicine. <laughs> I had very little experience of the 60s and 70s. But you would have been a patient. I no. I, I, there's a long story to that, which I won't go into, yeah, okay. but I was never a patient. But the problem is I know from the people who taught us at university that medicine was more leisurely and that we, we brought in a Medicare system and we started putting the clock on consultations, the concept of the honorary, the person who would spend the time not billing them, but they would do good and then charge the rich patients a hell of a lot more money. There was time differences between the 1960s, 70s and before compared to after Medicare's introduction. And Medicare overall is a good system for sickness and disease management, and it became very efficient. And you can make an argument that medicine has moved on massively since that time. But the relationship, the time, the ability to spend a therapeutic interaction with somebody has definitely disappeared. And in fact, I think if you ask most doctors these days, they don't think of a GP consultation or a specialist consultation as a therapeutic interaction. They think of it as an administrative interaction that leads to therapeutics. That I will see you for five minutes yeah. and then do a procedure, prescribe a drug, do something. Pass I you will on take to the placebo out of my therapy. Yes, and, and we have been far, far too keen to do that. If any area of medicine is open to beliefs, manipulation, um, cajoling a person into being pain-free, we call it placebo, but we do know that in pain, placebo management is horrific terrifically important. It's really, really important. When the osteoarthritis studies were done comparing glucosamine with celecoxib, there was this triumphant, celecoxib is better than glucosamine. The real story was pain relief occurred in 60% of the people on the placebo, 66% on the glucosamine, and 69% on celecoxib. 
what the big story was, was yeah. that the 60%, the 90% of all value mm. was being done in the placebo arm, not because of anything else we did. The focus on the last 5% is what uh, randomized controlled trials have done all the way through our last 100 years. And the ability to ignore placebo is, yes, but that's the rubbish that's not real science. Medicine is not real science. Medicine is the art of allowing a person to resume function, to return to life, to believe that they have a future, to do all of the things. And I think the discarding of that has been terrible for pain management, that what the doctor used to be able to do, and I still do today, is give confidence to a person that the future is not going to be like this forever. And that we call it psychic pain. Sometimes it's not psychic. It's real mm, experience mm, of pain. Mm. The relief that people have just knowing that there is a future is something that you can't do in those 5, 10, 15-minute consultations. We all get busy with the, oh, the randomized trials show that if I give you this, it will be better than that. And I think that we've forgotten in our medical training a lot of what used to be the compassion of medicine, the understanding, the bringing a person into that therapeutic relationship. And I believe in pain management, that is amazingly important. Doctors can make all the arguments they like, oh, you can't do that with heart disease, you can't do that with cancer. I'm agnostic about even those areas because when people's pain and suffering is relieved, it's amazing mm. what patients and clients can do for themselves. In medicine, we almost like don't even want to believe that. We want to believe that we hold the power, we hold the knowledge, and we will administer it without ever really going through that deeper understanding that my interaction with the suffering person in front of me is the number one reason that they are going to experience or not experience pain in their future. And so I'm, I'm a passionate believer that pain is the unacknowledged area of medicine that we keep on thinking that we have a technical answer for and none of the technical answers work out well, but the therapeutic relationship works out exceptionally well. That involves trust between patient and doctor. It involves real commitment from the doctor. You cannot fool a pain mm, patient. Mm, they mm. are super sensitive to you putting on an act of, oh, I believe that you believe you're in pain, darling. Um, functional pain is very hard for doctors to grab because we can't see the lesion. But when we believe people and work with them and give them a, a comfort that the future will be different from the past that they've experienced, we do good. When even um, psychologists see people and go back over the trauma history of the past and undo the traumas that keep on escalating pain in the present, they do good as well. So I think the unexplored areas of pain have been that we have an education that says pain is a literal thing. Here's the nerve endings. Here's the, um, the nociceptors. Here's the, what the uh, um, cannabinoids do. Here's what the opioids do. Then we've already bypassed a lot of what the therapeutic value would be. And I think getting back to that is something that naturopaths and traditional medicine has a deep, deep knowledge of. They have a tradition that goes back thousands of years to what does it take when you've got no trick to take the pain away? What is it, What does it take to take the pain and the experience and bring it down, down. To take that down from an escalating experience to a more and more controlled uh, feel, a feeling of comfort in the part of the person? Just before we move on, a point um, where you're mentioning the glucosamine trial, the GATE trial yeah. for our listeners, it was improperly done. They used a rubbish form of um, glucosamine and everybody speaks about it the wrong way. They say glucosamine plus chondroitin sulfate. Yeah. What they don't acknowledge is that it was glucosamine chloride, not glucosamine sulfate. Yeah. So they're using the wrong type for weight bearing pain. Anyway, moving right. on, I will put that up on the website for, effort for our listeners. Um, Let's go into the theories of pain, though. In 1960s, um, the gait theory was developed, but even the developer of the gait theory proposes that it, it may be on shaky ground in certain instances. I think, I mean, the gait theory still holds, but it's a spinal theory. There was a point where people were focusing on the spine, the kind of uh, sensory nerves, and the ability to interfere with the way those sensory nerves went. So we have one concept of pain is that there are nociceptors or unmyelinated fibers dotted all around the body looking for a particular type of stimulus. Um, the fascinating thing is the wrong stimulus doesn't cause pain in different areas. The liver has no pain receptors whatsoever. A very important organ. You would imagine that there would be some receptor for injury there, but the only receptor we have is when the capsule stretches 
there is a nonspecific pain that radiates to the right shoulder. Very, very minimal areas of pain reception. In the gut, there's no sensation of burning. You can put very hot things down there. There are stretch receptors which translate to a kind of burning sense of pain or gripping sense Trip of pain. Trip one Yeah. And so you have receptors appropriate to what the organ has run into in mm. the past. Mm. If you have stabbing, penetrating injuries in the gastrointestinal tract, you're already dead right. all, all the times up until when surgeons came around. So nature, it's not that it's insensitive to injury. It's just that there are types of injuries that are not survivable and there is no value in having receptors for every possible pain in every possible organ. Nearly everyone is surprised to know that the pain, the, the brain has no pain receptors. I did neurosurgery. You can put your finger into a brain there is no sense of pain. There is no receptor for the organ that receives all the information about all of the pain in the body. So the, the body is a strange thing when it comes to what's the threats that are being looked out for. Generally speaking, they're the survivable threats that if you get enough information quickly and you are motivated by pain with the adrenaline, noradrenaline, with the entire cascade of the hormones of the prostaglandins all being mobilized in a particular way, then the aversion, the withdrawal response, the ability to get away, the mobilization of the muscles with adrenaline, these are all things that enhance survival. So pain is not there to make us feel pain. Where that becomes a problem is not acute pain, which is a survival reflex, it becomes a problem when the pain is never ending. Chronic pain is a whole different world. And once we know as doctors that there is no damage to the tissue, then we think of our job as simply giving you a drug that will take away the pain, a kind of pain blocker. And that's, I think, where our, our, our difficulties arise. We pay no attention to and we give no credence to chronic pain that we can't see the cause for. And so we think of our job as simply give a drug that will eventually stop this person from complaining. So headaches, migraines, mm. we feel it. We feel the pain in the head. Where are the pain receptors firing here? <clears throat> there may not be any. Migraine is a very good example of what we cannot ever provide evidence for. A person experiences the migraine. What do we do? We ask them about uh, visual aura. Mm. We ask them about sensory aura. We ask them about what's going on in the brain, not in the head. And so there is a big difference. If you get a person with aura, that's a brain perception mm. of something that precedes a migraine. What does that mean about pain? Absolutely nothing, except that the aura leads on inevitably in many people to the migraine, which is excruciatingly bad. What do we do for migraines? We stop people having nausea and then we give a drug to try and uh, counter it. It's not that much better than putting a person in a dark room with no stimulus and music on. So the the studies on what really? you can do for migraine, yeah, the studies of what you can do for migraine show that we're relatively ineffective. But you and I both know, Andrew. But sumatriptan and they, cafago. Well, and... Yeah, they work in different ways. So even the caffeine is fascinating. Mm. People did go for coffees. But there are mutually exclusive ways. Sumatriptan was a triumph of a way to counteract a migraine once it got started. But it didn't tell us anything about the pain perception. It was just a vascular pathway that right. we were able to interfere with. The, the issue of placebo is something that definitely has to come in here, that what is a placebo treatment? Something that the doctor or the naturopath or the treater believes to be true, that in, inescapably they convey to the patient. So placebo effect is not the patient's belief in anything. It's the doctor's belief that something will do good. We became so cavalier at the time of the triptans coming out that they worked like magic while we believed them. So did penicillin for viral sore throats. Mm -hmm. So did right. a whole range of things that doctors did. You ask doctors, where we are furious about evidence-based medicine because once you have all the evidence that something doesn't work, the doctor's belief in the things that did work goes away and then they stop working. And in pain, that's particularly true. We believed in sumatriptan. It was an, a triumph of advertising as well. I still have people on the triptans. What they do now is, yes, it's a moderate help. It's not the magic that it was 20, 30 years ago. At that time, it worked well because it had a lot of placebo response going with it, the new magic pills, everyone anticipating the relief of their pain. Now it's just part of the normal armamentarium, and more often than not, it fails. In fact, we're going back a lot more 
to amitriptyline, to the old tricyclic antidepressants, mm. and exploring those as a preferable way to even the magic tryptan. So it's more complicated than it seems. I fall for this all the time. You know, I uh, say low dose naltrexone or um, cannabinoids, mm. they're the new trendies. Will they hold up over time? We don't know, but we know of mechanisms that they may fiddle with, interfere with, and we know that people who know about them believe in them passionately, and that makes pain research incredibly difficult to do. What I was talking about before with pain research is it's unethical to go and burn people and burn people and burn people and then find out whether placebos work or not. So pain research is stymied in a way that cardiovascular research is and other areas aren't. So it's not that we can't research pain. We do it every day in our practices. But what we do, how we experience it, the time we give to a person has a huge impact on the perception and the experience of pain in each patient or client that we see. How prevalent is pain in Australia then? Yeah. What, well, how big is this We only issue? have a couple of prevalent studies mm, because pain, pain itself, you know, when you say to a person, are you in pain, do you mean the pain of bereavement? Do you mean heart Ooh. pain? Do you, do you, what do you incorporate in pain? Tacotubo syndrome. Hmm. So the best pain studies that we have, in fact, come from nearly, I think, about 15, 16 years ago, or not, maybe even 2001. The pain prevalence study showed that if you're looking at how many people have a suffering pain at a given time, it goes up as the years go by. On average, over the entire population, around about 10 to 12 percent are experiencing pain at any one period of time. It's not trivial. That means, you know, two and a half, three million yeah, people yeah. in pain at any given period. And persistent chronic pain, when you get to your 50s, 60s and 70s, um, is around about 25 to 30 percent. So uh, I think it's under 30 percent. I think 25 percent. The peak in males tends to be in their 60s to 70s. Because females live a bit longer, they have a slightly higher peak, I think, of around about 28, 27, 28 percent. And that's in their 80s. So women have wow. more of an issue with pain because things wear out in the body and joints grind on each other and, you know, falls happen and hips hurt. And the longer you live, it seems more likely you are to do something or have some kind of chronic pain. So it's, it's not trivial. You could probably make an argument that it's 10% of the population. Compared to fatigue at 20% of the population, that there, there's similar kinds of numbers. It's a big percentage but because it sits in the background, because it is so normalized, mm. fatigue and pain and those kind of symptoms eventually become part of the landscape. We almost assume them to be there once a person gets to 60. We're all a bit surprised when someone says, nope, no pain anywhere, yeah. no arthritis anywhere, and you're 75 years of age. I have a, a short story, a tiny, tiny one. A farmer in his 70s from way out in the bush um, his experience was a fall that caused broken bones that uh, had him have surgery and he went back to the farm and continued to do his farming and bring the horses in on his 65,000 acres, living alone, living alone. Wow. His pain was severe, but it was not as severe as letting the horses be untended. And so he would go back there. He, they eventually put a cast on him to stop him going out. He fell off a little um, silo. Mm onto his back, four or five metres, broke the cast, and it put his back into place, as he <laughs> said, and he kept looking after the horses. He, he had um, a pancreatitis, a pain that most people would experience as extreme pain. Did it stop him from going and looking after the horses? Not at all. This was, to me, just a fascinating story because this person's expectations are I've got the horses to look after, yeah. not anything to do with pain. Pain was so far out of his mindset that even what we would regard as experimentally severe pain, fractured vertebras, you know, broken bones mm. around the pace, pancreatitis, which people experience as excruciating pain, nothing stopped him because the world that he lived in was a job he needed to do. And to my amazement. I went through the testing and think, oh boy, this is going to look bad when we get our testing back. Pancreatitis, exocrine, can't produce anything, malabsorption. No, this was a person whose life experience was, I've got a job to do. I'm 75. Whatever happens from this point doesn't matter to me. I've got to look after the horses. 
So when I rang him and I'm saying, well, the test results are good, he said, yeah, yeah, and he's breathless. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, look, we've got rains coming after a couple of years. I've got to get the horses in. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, there are differences in the way we perceive the world. Oh, yeah. If you have no room for pain, if life is so full and there are jobs to be done yeah. and the distraction and this kind of the kind of macro gateway theory. What importance theory. you place on pain yeah. as to other things that you How does it life? compete mm. with other things that I need to do? Mm. And I find that all the time in my practice, that once people have a purpose, once people find, say, the grandchildren can be quite healing with pain, that the concept of loneliness and experiencing arthritic pain is terrifying for a person who can only see, but I'm only going to get older and this pain will get worse put grandchildren in who jump on them and do all kinds of terrible things that could exacerbate the pain. It is amazing how analgesic that is. Laughter. I am reminded of a few examples. One was a small child who had broken his leg and th th there was there was a side ward, right? So there was, I think, six beds um, in this side ward, but a TV up one end had a Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. And this kid was on 75 milligrams of pethidine. Now, this was the days of pethidine, right? No. So that's maximum dose, still pain, you know, and his pain was six or seven. So it was, it was uncomfortable for him. All we did was swap him into the far bed, in, into the nearest bed of the Pac-Man. No pain, happy as, happy as Larry. It, really interesting. The other one was a, um, a friend's dad had a heart attack. And when he went in for an X-ray, they found a twenty-two bullet lodged in his chest. <laughs> and he said, oh, I wonder, I remember, I remember something about that ricocheting off something. <laughs> I mean, he just placed no importance on it. Whereas me, I go out with a hurty knee. I mean, mm. I go out seriously. Like I did my, I did my finger under the sink, you know, just yeah. with the plug. I, <laughs> I have, I have one simple parable, which I think is important. In my earliest years, I just learned a little bit about homeopathics and bark flower remedies and these types of things in my practice way back in the distant, his, you know, the mists of time, as you were referring to. And in my practice up in Erina, a kid came in from the school next door with a broken arm, not a green stick. It was, you know, hanging at quite an angle. I had no analgesics at the time. And my naturopath, who was working with me there, said, oh, there's this thing called rescue remedy. And I'm thinking, oh, God, yeah, yeah, no. rescue <laughs> remedy. The rescue remedy goes but... to the kid and 15 seconds later, he's not crying or screaming anymore. We called the ambulance to take him to the hospital. Ambulance came in. We've got a loose bandage around this arm. They said, what have you given him? And I said, well, nothing. We just had this rescue remedy. And they said, well, he hasn't got a broken arm because, you know, he's, he'd be screaming. Mm. They look at the arm, take him to the hospital. A few hours later... A hospital rep came out to get the rescue remedy and took it from our practice. And they were convinced that there was opioids, right. that, they, that I had administered a drug without keeping a control. They took it for analysis. And in the end, what they discovered was that this was 97.5% water and 2.5% alcohol. And I got a beating on my hand for giving a person five <laughs> drops of 2% <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> alcohol. But it, the thought of my professional colleagues was, this has to have been some drug yeah, because yeah. only a drug could do that. The ambulance officers, the same thing. The long and the short of it is that one of the ambulance officers came back and started putting rescue remedy in the ambulance just in case they ever had oh, some God. value for the future. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it stayed with this one guy and it was just his little magic trick. Oh, wow. But, that, you know, that's we still have to come back to what is a, what do we do as practitioners about the experience of pain. How do we separate chronic pain from acute pain? How do we separate psychic, you know, bereavement pain from other types of pain? And one of the answers to that is we just have to accept that the experience of the other person is what we're trying to hook into. It's not an experimental, literal, we cannot do a test to say, oh, your pain levels are this. The only test we can do is ask the person on a visual analog scale, watch your pain levels and to watch what we do and what we can contribute come into that. There are some good therapeutic options. The big negative one these days is the opioids, the, the uh, oxycodone and the codeine. They're coming off the list and people are saying, you know, we've got to get rid of these. They still have their place mm. for acute pain management. Absolutely. They're really, really good, but they're not good for bereavement pain. Mm. They're not good for the types of pains which are going to go on for years and years to come. So... That's the area that we find ourselves in now. 
getting off the drugs and moving on to something that is sustainable and isn't going to escalate and destroy the person's life. What about the practitioner judging the patient, mm. i.e.? Probably the best example that comes to mind here for me is endometriosis. How many women are poorly managed, misdiagnosed, not diagnosed for years, not believed for years until something happens? Um, their pain is very poorly managed. Yeah. And they try and speak to their doctor about, I am in pain. I can't function. And there's this total misbelief. I was speaking with Donna Chicha about this from Endometriosis Australia. And, um, I mean, you can hear the frustration in her voice. Um, how, how do we get over that practitioner judging the patient? What yeah. skills can we give our listeners so that they can be better practitioners? One of, one of the issues, endometriosis is a good example of misogyny in medicine. Yes. You know, the hysterical pain, the hypochondriacal pain. We have these concepts of women somehow experience things that we real men who know what literal things are don't experience. Except for me. Yeah, <laughs> and except for me and except for every other person as well. So that there is a cultural issue with medicine that takes, you know, a couple of generations to get it out before we start to hear people and not prejudge them before they've even said their first words. One of the issues for practitioners is feelings of powerlessness. If you can do nothing, you stop hearing the person's complaints yeah. because you don't feel competent to be able to relieve that person's complaints. That leads to isolation in that therapeutic relationship. So one of the very important things is for all practitioners to feel confident and competent in what they are going to do to advise people. All the way from the simplest things, can this person exercise? Can they move their muscles? Can they do yoga? Can they do simple things of mindfulness that are going to change the perception of pain itself? Because we have no objective measure, the only measure we have is the experience and the expression of the person before us. And it is a thousand year history or a 5,000 year history of a male run profession, a masculine type of literal profession, denying the experience of especially women and prejudging it, saying, well, what can you do about it? Nothing. Therefore, oh, come on, grow up. You know, if you just didn't experience it so much, yeah, are you sure there's anything there? Mm -hmm. We make ourselves feel better often at the expense of the person who we belittle. So the education of practitioners about there's much more to do for pain than you ever imagined, especially if you had the training that we doctors have, where we think we're dependent upon the dosage, the precise milligram dosage of drug, the morphine equivalent dosage charts. We pay so much attention to that, that we lost sight of the very things that now we understand make a much, much higher difference. The therapeutic relationship is the start, but the finding of the, the motivation of the person, what brings this person to life, what brings them out of the fearful constriction that pain applies to a person and expands their horizons to pain-free abilities that they can do something about. Yoga is a tricky one because there are some people with pain where the asanas of yoga is still a problem. Mm. But yoga is not just the asanas. The yoga is the breath, is the experience and the ability to finally move into a meditative response for the pain not to carry with it all the emotion that the Aristotelian version of pain is, a, is about. If you don't carry the emotion, pain is relieved significantly. Compl not completely, but you could get significant reduction of pains just by taking what's the emotions that are correlated with this and how do we ease those emotions. You can bomb a person out. You can give drugs. And I have done this a thousand times and I regret it when every time that I think when the person say, but give me something for my pain. And they're not willing to hear well, how about we try mild exercise? How about we try meditation? This was going to be my next question, the, the converse, the, the difficult conversation about can we explore other options? Yeah. That, uh, well, you, that's because medicine that. created a world in which there's a pill for everything. Mm -hmm. And once you have that as your primary belief system for an entire population in the first world, you know, in Australia, America, Britain, in Europe, we have an expectation that pain is just a thing that should be optional and we have taken away. 
we have lost the concepts of what's the meaning of the pain. How much do I carry from my past? How much of the pain I experience now is the unexpressed trauma from when I was a kid abused by alcoholic parents? We have to go back into exploring those. What does it take? Time, empathy, touch, incredibly important in pain that the majority of people that I see no longer have any sensory input. They no longer have touch as a way of relieving pain. When a person touches another person, there can be an initial withdrawal response from people who are in pain all the time. It's almost like, don't touch me. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I am unstable here. But eventually the therapeutic touch is unbelievably important in releasing those endorphins and in mobilizing the pain relieving response. An isolated human experiences pain completely differently to a person who is experiencing touch the whole time. So those basic things, massage, touch, loving, sex, sex is one of the best pain relievers we know, but people Not retreat. with your patients. No, no. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> a clear reminder. A clear um, reminder. Yes, yes. But sex has an ability to mobilize so many different hormones. And sex does not necessarily mean intercourse, but that whole thing of loving touch yeah. of sexual contact with a, a person, a lover, a partner, those things make massive differences compared to the strongest of the drugs that we have. And and vice versa, the with isolation. Gold. Yep. You know, the isolation can amplify yes. pain and, and things like that. And I think if there's one thing we can offer today is that is if you amplify any sensation, it becomes pain. Yeah. Sensation amplified, a, a withdrawal even from foods, right? One thing that I've found is people find restrictive diets, oh, they relieve some of my symptoms, but they put people into a sensory kind of dead end that if you always have food as a fearful, restrictive thing, then your world restricts chemical sensitivity. You restrict your world. Yeah. Once your world is restricted, all stimulus starts to become on that urge, on that verge of painfulness. So this is the mashed potato and peas brigade. The the people that have um, restricted all sorts of foods down to yep. the lowest common denominator, if you like, and now they're sensitive to everything. Yes, and they're so, so they're sensitive to food. Some are sensitive to sound, some to touch, some to chemicals, right. petrochemicals, and the like. So the fearful withdrawal. After many years of putting people through this, you know, I did restrictive diets, we did, you know, chemical free homes. But the fact is that as you restrict all sensory input, what's left over starts to become experienced as an escalating pain. And we don't think of it as pain as in nociceptors out there experiencing shortage of food. It's just that now more and more foods that should be nutritious and good for the person start to become a problem. The anticipation of adverse reactions starts to become a problem. It's important that people be able to re-emerge into their world and have, be pain-free with the with the life that they wish to live, not pain-free on the drugs that put them to bed and prevent them from leaving their mm, room mm. and leave, leave them with migraines in dark rooms half of their life. So it's not, this is not a prescription. It's if you are before a patient or before a client and that client is, is describing a constrictive life with the fear of the future, with pain becoming the dominant sensation and escalating with less and less sensory input, then our job is to reverse that. You can use tools like cannabis. People find cannabis does that very, very well. Low-dose naltrexone. There are tools that can be used temporarily which switch on the endo, uh, the kind of um, the endogenous opioids, the metenkeflins and the like. There are tricks that we can do to start that process. And I think that that's important. In the herbal area, there are lots and lots of good herbs from headaches and they're very, very restricted periods of time of use. Where our problem arises, I believe, is when we think of things that work, work in the short term being very useful for the long term. So if we keep with our patients and our clients saying, here's a short term answer that can give you some relief while we move to a longer term and sustainable answer. Can you do yoga? Can you do mild exercise? Do you have the opportunity for touch with or in a relationship with a person? Or if not, can, a, can therapeutic touch be used to relieve the pain? That mobilizing the endogenous pain relief is important but de-escalating so that there is not a fear of every new stimulus setting off ever more pain off into the future. So you've got the people that just have not got time for pain. Right. They're, they're the people, you know, you don't seem to have to worry about. 
Um, they may still need pain relief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, you don't have to worry about that escalating off into the future. Amplification of pain. Yes. Then you've got the people that already expect uh, they're in pain, their pain's amplified by some factor, but they expect a pain relief thing. And they may not be open yet, he yeah. says, to other forms of therapy which may decrease that amplification. Yes. Then you've got the people that just say, help, I'll do anything. I'll do everything. Take away help. my pain. Take away my pain. So the problematic one is the one in the middle here. They just want a pill. They just want it mm. now. They just want to go away. How do you have that difficult conversation to say, look, yes, there's a, a quick fix, but it's a quick fix for now and you're back next week. Are you interested? Where are you at? Can we investigate? There is evidence for. Yeah pain relieving therapies, which are not drugs, which have effect, which have efficacy. How do you open that conversation mm. in, let, let us say, the, the, the closed patient? You ask easy questions at the end of every <laughs> podcast. I think that these are the ones that can be explored forever. But if the initial discussion with the person is, you don't need a pill in the long term, you need a sustainable solution, which is going to de-escalate have that pain diminished not in an hour, but in a month, yeah. a six month and a 12 month period. You need to, in effect, get younger and get less pain as that time goes by and make it clear that most of the short term fixes are exactly what they are for short term fixes. They're a way to get to the other side of pain occupying all of your mind. And people go down that path because a friend of mine said this, when you're in pain, the only thing you think of is pain. Mm. When you're not in pain, everything else is an opportunity to think about. What we have to do is invade that mind with other things to think about, to, with not just distractions. This isn't a Sudoku or, you know, play a bit of chess. It is what's the meaning for you? What will motivate you to want to be pain-free and to live a life pain-free, to imagine that life pain-free? Visualization can do it for some people. I tend to use literal things because I'm a doctor. I tend to use things like uh, low-dose tricyclics, amitriptyline. People get the experience of, oh, that's not morphine, and it worked. Do you find in that state, in their pain-free state or their lessened state, then they're more open? They are. They're definitely more open because one of the things that happens in my practice, which doesn't happen in most, is people are on drugs that they've been on apparently successfully. They come to me to get off them. And the question is, yes, I can take my codeine, my 10 codeine a day, and I feel like I'm out of pain, but I don't like it. I don't like the constipation. I don't like the adverse. I don't like that I am doped up the whole time. I can't experience any joy in life. I am pain-free but neutral mm. rather than living a life where the pain is peripheral to anything that I'm experiencing otherwise. So I do have the job of taking people off those drugs and it's a really tricky thing to do. I, I think that that's a worthy of an entire podcast. If we go through the literal side of pain, what are the tools, what are the simple things you can do to get people from my only focus is pain to, okay, pain is manageable, where do we move it now? And that's where the discussion really does take place. People, males of 70 years of age, become open to the idea of meditation. I am too young for that to have happened to me yet, but you know, in the future, I rather hope that those will be my futures. But meditation, mindfulness, yoga, acupuncture, acupuncture is incredibly valuable mm. as a starting oh, point. Yeah. And the whole thing of this sham acupuncture versus real acupuncture, the job is not to do trials. The job is to find things for an individual that are effective in allowing them to re-enter the life pain-free. Acupuncture works brilliantly for person after person. And then the next person I think it'll work for, nothing. Yeah. Just nothing yeah. happens whatsoever. What works for that person is, oh, but I've taken to walking and I've got a dog or I've got a cat, or I've got, or a, I've got a, a pet meaning. cockroach. And provide meaning provides an, a way of a person moving from the experience internally that escalates to a de-escalation of that and a meaning outside. So I, I am a big fan of even simple things like pets, visiting the grandchildren, family, eating meals at the same time with the family members, love, affection, cuddling, contact. They have a powerful effect on pain. 
that no drug that I've ever prescribed has ever done. And so that ability to move from things that are not all that effective and have a lot of side effects to a life in which pain is still there, but I don't mind. The mind plays the part there. And that idea of T.E. Lawrence of, yes, it hurts, but only if I pay attention to it. Where is my attention? Somewhere else in life. And if I can provide as the doctor that other thing to place the attention on and give the person the confidence that they are not going to be experiencing this for the next 30 years of their life, then the pain goes back to its normal position. De-escalated, yes, it's there, but it doesn't dominate. It takes the person out of themselves and back into the life they want to live. I love, I'm looking forward to inviting you back for our next podcast where we'll delve into some of the therapies that yeah. you um, employ for, to relieve pain. The tricks. The tricks. The tricks that the get bag. you apart across the first hurdle or two and then the long run is... But of course, I think the foundation in any practitioner relationship should be one of pure purity for you, for, for the practitioner. Um, and in your case, it's care. Hmm. You know, and I thank you for that. Thanks for joining us on FX Medicine today. Been a pleasure again. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Donahue. Join us for our new podcast series, FX Omics. We'll be exploring the new technologies of integrative medicine, including genomics, metabolomics, the microbiome, and many more fields that are transforming healthcare. We're focusing on how they apply to practitioners and how we can incorporate them into our patient care. We aim to make these exciting and sometimes challenging fields relevant to you and your practice. Search for FX Omics on your favourite podcast platform and we look forward to your company.